So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Jorge Otero Pailos. I'm the director of the Historic Preservation Program. And um, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to have you all here for our Historic Preservation Lecture Series. Um, it's a real pleasure and honor to welcome Shelby Green. She's professor of law at the Elizabeth Haub School of Law at Pace University where she teaches and writes in the areas of property, real estate transactions, housing, and historic preservation. So we're very fortunate to have Professor Green teaching a master class in our program this semester titled Historic Narratives from the Architecture in and of Public Spaces. So students in that class will be more familiar with Professor Green's recent thinking on this subject and this lecture will benefit the rest of our academic community and the interested public that joins us tonight. She is the Assistant Secretary and the Chair of the Legal Education Group of the Real Property Trust and Estate Section of the American Bar Association. She also serves as the American Bar, Associa the American Bar Association as the editor of the Keeping Current Property column in the magazine Probate and Property. And she also organizes and occasionally presents and always moderates the monthly webinar, Professor's Corner for the American Bar Association. She's a leading academic voice in historic preservation law. And she is the co-author with Professor Nicholas Robinson of Historic Preservation Law and Culture and also of Historic Preservation Stories and Law, recently published in 2020. Her passion for historic preservation extends to her public service, and she is a member of the Board of Directors of the Jay Heritage Center, which manages the John Jay Estate, National Historic Landmark in Rye, which I think many of our students are very familiar with because they worked there last semester in their studio. Her lecture tonight is titled Deconstructing Collective Memory in Public Spaces. And collective memory is put in quotes in her title. Um, and of course, she will be unpacking this thorny concept of collective memory in light of the recent debates surrounding public sculptures in public spaces that celebrate and ennoble what for many of us are ignoble historical figures. The notion of, of collective memory has a long history in historic preservation, beginning with the French sociologist Maurice Halbach, who famously wrote about how what we would now in today's parlance call uh, the values uh, of, of Christian evangelism would be spatialized in urban spaces in Jerusalem and the Holy Land. He, would, he, he didn't use this term spatializing values, but uh, uh, I, I think it's the way that we, we, we've come to understand his thinking on this. Um, the concept, of course, of collective memory has undergone a number of major revisions since the, in, in the intervening century or so since Halbox. And I think Halbox would be quite receptive to Professor Green's own deconstruction of the term collective memory, as I also anticipate that this audience will be. So without further, further ado, uh, let me uh, welcome Professor Shelby Green and please join me in welcoming her to our virtual podium. Shelby, the podium is yours. Thank, oh, you. thank you, Jorge. <laughs> so as uh, Jorge just uh, stated, the concept of collect collective memory is certainly not of my own invention but has been the topic of philosophers, historians, and social scientists for some time now. So in my talk this evening, I intend to comment on the concept and the concept of the history of blacks and other non-white groups in this country, in particular, as it pertains to the ongoing dialogues about the memorials long constructed in celebration of the Confederacy. So in this discussion, I will borrow ideas and phrases uh, from known writers on the topic but offer some of my own insights into the stated uh, context. Today, most societies embrace the role of remembrance as an element of being. Remembering past and its corollary 
the memorializing of collective historical memory may even rise to a moral obligation. Not only has collective memory served to orient us to our place in the evolution of humankind, it has also led us to less worthy positions like war and denigration of others, to rancor and resentment, rather than to embrace of the other or accommodation. Memory has propelled us to determine to exact revenge for injuries, both real and imagined, rather than to commit to the hard work of repairing and restoring old relations. The events of the two world wars readily come to mind in this context. When Germany under Hitler, feeling unfairly burdened by the responsibility of the cost of the first war, launched a second war that wreaked untold misery. Of course, there were other animating forces behind Hitler's horrors. We can see some parallels in the Civil War. After the 1877, after 1877, when Reconstruction ended with the compromise of the 1876 election results, and the Union soldiers withdrew from the Confederate States, the losing side of this fateful war was left to inflict untold horrors on the newly freed slaves. Although not in a formal war, there was a concerted effort by the Confederacy to regain its status and esteem. To do so, chroniclers of history and those in power created a memory of the South and the war. They strive to instantiate this memory into the culture through written text and emblems of the Confederacy that spoke the narratives of a wronged but honorable people. So in the work Between Memory and History, Le Lure de Mémoire, Pierre Nora stated that memory and history, far from being synonymous, appear now to be in fundamental opposition. Memory is life, born by living societies founded in its name. It remains in permanent evolution, open to the dialectic of remembering and forgetting, unconscious of its successive deformations, vulnerable to manipulation and appropriation, susceptible to being long dormant and periodically revived. History, on the other hand, is the reconstruction, always problematic and incomplete of what is no longer. Memory is a perpetually actual phenomenon, a bond tying us to the eternal present. History is a representation of the past. By this, it seems that Nora is speaking not only of memories that are constructed by individuals, their personal past, but also those that are commanded or propagandized by the existing power structure or by powerful groups. Individual reconstructions of personal past often replicate and support collective faith in an overarching myth. People try to make sense of their experiences and places in the world by constructing explanations of their own histories, in part by drawing upon prevalent narratives in public discourse those held by other individuals within their, to use a phrase, au courant, pod. Hegel commented in the philosophy of history uh, that history combines in our language the objective as well as the subjective side. It means both the things that happen and the narration of the things that happen. Without memory of the past, there is no history in the sense of the events that are meaningful to the collective. Collective consciousness presumes collective memory. Without it, there's no justice, no political structure, and no collective objectives. While personal memory evokes different personal associations, this predicate for self-identity cannot be removed from its social context. Self-consciousness requires a social context by virtue of its very conceptualization. Memory, not even the most intimate or personal, can be disconnected from society from the language and systems molded by the society over many generations. Memory is characterized as driven by a system of clear symbols, times, places, monuments, victory arches, museums, texts, customs, and images. And to refer back to Maurice Halbach that uh, Jorge mentioned in his historical memory and collective memory published after his death in the Nazi concentration camp, he insisted on a distinction between history and collective memory. History aims for universal objective truth severed from the psychology of social groups, while every collective memory requires support of a group delimited in space and time. Thus, our view of the past does not come primarily from professional historical scholarship, but from a, match, a much more complicated and interwoven set of relationships to media, places, 
family tradition and the spaces of our upbringing with all their regional, ethnic, and class diversity, to name just a few factors. Again, just as personal memory is now understood to be highly selective, shaped by needs and contexts, so is collective memory a product of social groups and their ever-evolving character and interest. By this, it, it might be said that collective memory is constructed, indeed curated, amidst a perpetual political background. Societies, in fact, reconstruct their past rather than faithfully record them in order to serve the needs of contemporary culture, manipulating the past in order to mold the present. And collective memory then refers to how groups remember their past. To understand a country's memories is to grasp something essential about their nat national identity and outlook. A collective memory affects public understanding of the past and is promoted to that end. It implies that the meanings ascribed to various events will be taken as pronounced without question or individual assessment. Collective memory presupposes a degree of homogeneity within the relevant community and a willingness to submit to orthodoxy and the power to put forth the narratives. So in this respect, the choice of narratives to promote publicly by proclamation to be representative of the collective memory is deliberate. Sometimes they reflect the memories that are in fact embraced. In other cases, they reflect those memories that are imagined to be true or thought desirable for the public to believe. They work to inculcate listeners to a preferred set of political and social values. They are to be sure a positive justification for creating a collective memory, such as for social cohesion, respect for law, but often collective memory is used more nefariously for the oppression of the powerless, such as former slaves. The curated memory is written by those with control over the recounting of history in public places, physical as well as literary spaces. And the early Congress was reluctant to appropriate funds for a monument to George Washington. In John Quincy Adams' view, monuments were anathema to democracy. True memory, it was claimed, lay not in a pile of dead stones, but in the living hearts of the people. But commemoration has since become de rigueur deeply rooted in the cultural practices of the nation. We commemorate by flags, namings, and statues, which become the physical embodiments of collective memory. The names of public buildings and your monuments symbolize the power of the dominant groups and the class nature of social subordination. And they do much more. Their materiality prescribes an ordering of relations in society that they are erected in public spaces lends legitimacy and sanction to the asserted social and cultural power. So the, for this point, let us focus a bit on the statues erected in honor of prominent members of the Confederacy of the Civil War. Most of the commemoration of Civil War heroes, quote unquote, were erected some 30 to 40 years after the war end, ended. A few have been erected in the last several decades. All told, there are nearly 2,000 such memorials, including statues, names of schools, public buildings, bridges, and highways. Most statues were commissioned by state and local governments and placed on public spaces, courthouse steps, public squares, and public parks. Others by private donation from heritage groups, such as the United Daughters of the Confederacy but typically erected in public spaces with permission by the government. From the standpoint of collective memory, the constancy and omnipresence of a monument in a particular area makes it culturally imposing. The size, mass, and materiality monopolizes the, the dialogue. The inevitability and immortality of these monuments is assured by a host of legal mechanisms, including state statue statutes, that prohibit individuals and local communities from removing, altering, and even contextualizing them. The laws of property and gifts also operate as impediments to their legal removal, ensuring that they will forever stand to speak their stories. So what do the Confederate monuments say? They are owed to the lost cause narrative, an apology but not in the sense of asking for forgiveness, but as a rationalization to be pardoned for thrusting the region in, into such a tremendously costly battle. 
The casualties from the war were untold and unrivaled by, by all later wars in which this country has fought. More than 600,000 between the two armies. The war wreaked untold economic devastation on the South. The vast portion of the Southern wealth was lost to burnings and military destruction and loss of labor of slaves. The Union General William T. Sherman engaged in total war, burning and ravaging Atlanta and parts of the South of South Carolina to put down the insurrection by uh, treasonous states. He aimed not just to conquer the rebels, but to demoralize and punish. Moreover, if the promises of the Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th were fulfilled, whites would lose the privilege of whiteness. After Reconstruction ended, a now deposed Southern power employed various measures to regain its place at the top of the hierarchy. Through legal tools like black codes that imposed onerous conditions on work by newly freed slaves, on where they might live, how they might travel, and whom they may marry, and liter literacy tests that prevented blacks from voting, and also extra legal measures like the terror from the uh, Ku Klux uh, Klan, the former Confederacy reinstituted slavery by another name. This dominance was reinforced through monuments designed to speak for eternity. Again, mon the monuments that commemorated selected heroes of the lost cause spoke a narrative that aimed to strengthen one community but weaken another. Those with political power organized the public spaces, uh, thus to teach the public the desired political lessons. The Confederate flag, for example, is felt by many as a symbol of slavery and succession, Yet the flag is proffered as a symbol of valor and sacrifice and a reminder of a cr critical episode uh, in the history of the state uh, in which it flies. On the other hand, adopting the Confederate flag alters no rights, on one hand rather, adopting the Confederate flag alters no rights or privileges, privileges of any contemporary. On the other, the flag honors a time when rights and privileges of many citizens were violated outrageously. So it, it, it would take many decades after the war's end before Blacks could see any fulfillment of the promises of the Civil War amendments. You know, starting in, in 1917, where the Supreme Court struck down uh, racial zoning laws in New Orleans. And then in 1948, where the Supreme Court ruled that racial uh, covenants and deeds were not enforceable. And then in 1954, the Supreme Court ruled in Brown versus Topeka of Brown forces the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, that overrule the separate but equal uh, doctrine. And then another 100 years after the Civil War were statutes enacted to extend um, civil rights to uh, Blacks, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. So these gains were Hard fought using a combination of protest and calculated legal strategy by the NAACP. But even with legal protection, the exclusions of blacks from the amenities and opportunities of society persist to this day. The legacies of, of exclusion from particular neighborhoods is still revealed uh, in racial maps. And of course, there are disparate rates of home ownership uh, and access to healthcare and other kinds of job opportunities uh, in this country on account of, of race. So how did the, the story of the Civil War um, morph from a case of treason to one of honor? So the lost cause narrative was con con concocted to explain and justify the unlawful decision to succeed from the Union. Uh, it was a false narrative. So the impetus to recast the war began shortly after the conclusion of the war. Matthew Brady, the celebrated Civil War photographer, provided graphic accounts of the horrors of the war, you know, bodies rotting in the fields where they fell, images of the results of crude medical surgery on the battleground, the devastation of the earth wrought by a cannonball. But not accounting for the decision as to what to memorialize, the photos provided an objective narrative of the evils of war. At the same time, there was a chronicling of war from another vantage. A Richmond newspaper editor, uh, Edward Pollard, began writing a history of the war even as soon as it began, uh, even before it became history. His account 
began with an explanation of the reasons for secession, recounting at length reasons being the controversy over slavery, which had roots in the various compromises um, made between the North and South over which states would be slave and which free, uh, important of expanded federal power. Treachery was a term used to characterize the North, that it was impatient uh, and dark. The motives behind the Confederate cause was admitted to be in the fence of slavery. When the war was lost, Southerners who wished to save something from the ruins needed to redefine their reasons for resisting so valiantly. In Pollard's complete version of the account published in 1866, the lost cause, the story had changed. He stated that slavery, the slavery question, uh, was not to be taken as the independent controversy in, the, in American uh, politics. It was not a moral dispute. It was more an incident of sectional animosity. That is a pretext for the North's jealousy of the South's greater power in the early Republic. He protested uh, that Southern slavery was really the mildest in the world. Pollard declared that slavery was gone forever, that there was no need to discuss the moral questions about it and as it would only serve to prejudice the North even further against the South. He claimed that it was significant only as part of the contest for political power, that it represented not two moral theories, but hostile sections and opposite civilizations. His new history operated to elevate the South to an honorable position in contrast to the coarse and materialistic North. His book was immensely popular as it purported to cast slavery as merely a side uh, in the war that was really about Northern aggression. The new narrative was critical to rehabilitating the failed Confederacy uh, itself. So some narratives I think can be rejected absolutely as false, uh, that slavery and segregation and exclusion had any moral value. But should we continue to indulge the lost cause narrative not if it provides the predicate for acts of supremacy and racist dialogues or acts of violence. By distorting historical truth and relevance, commemoration tends to distort future social change. Societies like individuals are necessarily rooted in the past. Rational processes serve to develop the character of our society over the course of history, with each generation contributing to a continually evolving sense of national identity and destiny unthinkingly clinging to frozen images of the past as they are revealed in these monuments necessarily unnecessarily limits future change. Revering past narratives through commemoration discourages critical dialogue. Commemoration as it stands tries to monopolize and dominate collective memory. What the monuments do try to do is to freeze time enabling one historical period or episode to control subsequent ones. They portend dedicated attitudes. Traditionally dedicated attitudes refer to original understandings of a tradition or social practice. Dedicated attitudes are attractive because they reject or limit the degree of reflective criticism and therefore moral uncertainty and anxiety that such criticism may engender. More perversely, dedicated attitudes purport to resolve social conflicts and determine the appropriate amount of change not by reflection on an immediate issue, but by rote application of prescribed attitudes. They seek to control time and future events by creating a fixed set of cultural meanings for future generations. The meanings and narratives would change only if those who write them allow, but they eschew deliberative attempts to affect those changes. So That said, um, about the inevitability of um, personal influence in recounting history, let's consider, consider for a moment what commemoration does. An idiosyncratic vision constructed by the dominant powers within the historical drama without the chance for rebuttal, that is without the type of debate central to deliberative culture characterizes the commemoration of Confederate monuments. As such, it limits cultural messages to its historical circumstances and to a univocal uncontested message. It concretizes, fixes, and prevents revision of contestable cultural messages. The messages are written 
in stone. A monument to Robert E. Lee, as opposed to Clara Barton, is not uh, innocuous. It prescribes one narrative, prescribing one narrative makes invisible uh, the other. It serves to diminish self, much as was found in the Brown versus Board of Education uh, case where the court found that separate but equal was not equal if the message to one is that you may not enter because you are black and intrinsically uh, different. The exclusion operated to diminish self-worth by prescribing collective memory through commemorations of these ugly monuments. We also erase and deny others. So it's, it's not, it wasn't just the South who engaged in retellings of narratives to serve a particular um, uh, end. And this calls to mind a recent um, story involving the battle at Pearl Harbor. Uh, one sailor, uh, Dory Miller, a mess attendant, was collecting laundry aboard the battleship USS West Virginia when the Japanese attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. He vaulted to the bridge where he aided the ship's mortally wounded captain. He fired on Japanese planes with an anti-aircraft gun that as a servant he had not been trained to use and then pulled men who would otherwise have died from the burning oil coated waters of the harbor. He was one of the last sailors to leave the floundering ship. While any other seaman would have been given awards for this heroism, Miller was not. Um, and there were two reasons. First, as a black man and humble, a sharecropper's son, he was not permitted to serve as a regular sailor as that would require that black men and white men share quarters. Indeed, 15 sailors aboard the ship who wrote a letter complaining about their uh, being relegated to this low status were jailed and dishonorably discharged from the Navy. Second, the politics at the time did not encourage recognition of the contributions of blacks. But after the leading papers that catered to black audiences worked to complete the record, the story morphed from a tale of racial exclusion into a false allegory of triumph over a brand of institutional racism that long outlived him. You know, while segregation persisted in the military well into the Korean War, diminishing chiefly because of manpower shortages, the campaign narratives of national leaders like Ronald Reagan in the 1970s included uh, a thrilling account in which a black sailor confined to kitchen duties ended great segregation by firing a machine gun at the enemy. A story that completely erased the Navy's practice of racial segregation. In its recent revisions of the narrative, the Navy has owned up to the truth and decided to name a newly commissioned supercarrier, the USS Dory Wilson. Uh, and don't get me started with uh, 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 the story of Custer's last stand. Until recently, the monuments only celebrated Custer's soldiers, but none of the Native Americans uh, who fought to resist an invasion in, into their territory. So the commemoration of the Civil War helped to shape racial relations within American society, removing Americans from mainstream public memory. Through the last century, defeating the dream of racial equality and advancing the cause of white supremacy. Some scholars have pondered the relationship between commemoration and tradition and find that commemorative projects create core elements of memory that uh, persist. So a recent controversy evolving a suggested new narrative uh, is revealed in the um, 1619 uh, project. Uh, as stated, the lost cause was an apology and a transparent attempt to whitewash a desire to preserve the institution of slavery. Under this narrative, the claimed reason for war, states' rights, necessarily raises the question, rights to what? To own slaves? To be uh, free from the constraints of federal government? Some have pointed out that there was no logical connection between states' autonomy and racial oppression. The two merely coincided as an accident of history. And there's no total uh, to the numbers of historical accounts of the Civil War and highly respected historians for whom this topic is their life's work. Uh, James McPherson, Shelby Foote, Sean Willits, Eric Foner immediately come to mind uh, who write stories that conflict head on with Pollard's 1866 account. But the recent project by the New York Times Magazine called the 1619 Project 
is an example that purports to expose the idea of collective memory as it pertains to our slave history as being uh, fallacious. The project, a historical analysis of how slavery has shaped American political and social and economic institutions is named for the year in which slavery was first introduced in North America. It is a collection of essays written with the aim of, of placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the center of our national narrative. Viewed from the perspective of those historically denied the rights enumerated in the founding documents, the project reveals or, or purports to reveal a deeply flawed American narrative. One continuing theme is that the legacies of slavery persist to define race relations and deprivations. It is manifested in uh, exclusion from housing, the legacies of racial covenants still mark the boundaries of communities. There's a presumption of criminality. Uh, police officers shoot first and inquire. There's a, an idea of intellectual inferiority, which precludes professional growth in many fields. But the project offers an assessment of slavery in the politics and the nation's development, not only as the cause of the Civil War, but also that it was a reason for fighting the Revolutionary War as England at the time was moving toward abolition. The project was met with both praise, many school systems incorporated it into their curriculum, and castigation. In a letter to the New York Times, a cohort of noted historians challenged the cynicism of the project, that every essay tracing social, racial injustice from slavery to the present day spoke to the endurance of a racial caste, and that it, it expressed a profound pessimism about white America. The critics also referred to matters of verifiable fact that could not be described as interpretation or framing that stated the project um, and stated the project reject reflected a displacement of historical understanding by ideology. One writer in the Atlantic Monthly article, uh, Fight Over the 1619 Project, is not about facts, found that underlying each of the disagreements in the letter was not just a matter of historical fact, but a conflict about whether Americans from the founders to the present day are committed to the ideals they claim to revere. Uh, the, uh, the writer makes the point that there is still a reluctance to teach slavery in schools. And this reluctance stems from the deep abiding American need to conceive of and understand our history as progress, as a story of a people and a nation that always sought the improvement of humankind, the advancement of liberty and justice, the broadening of pursuits of happiness for all. But clearly these privileges and, and hopes were not extended to all Americans as revealed in the legalized racial segregation and terror that persisted for nearly a century after the Civil War ended. The deep-seated concern expressed by those historians demanding corrections was that placing the enslavement of black people and white supremacy at the forefront of a project somehow diminishes American history. Historical interpretations are often contested and these debates often reflect the perspective of the participants. But is this preferred alternative conception of American history, not unlike the lost cause narrative? For decades, a group of white historians known as the Dunning School um, portrayed the reconstruction as a tragic period in the words of the, in their words, a scandalous misrule of the carpetbaggers and Negroes uh, brought on by the misguided enfranchment of blacks, black men. As historian Eric Foner has written, the Dunning School and its interpretation of Reconstruction helped provide moral and historical cover for the Jim Crow system. Uh, Dunning's casting of the era has uh, earlier uh, been challenged by the influential black sociologist W.E.B. W.E.B. Du Bois in Black Reconstruction in America, uh, where he describes Reconstruction as an imperfect but noble effort to build a multiracial racial democracy in the South. Sean Willens, the historian at Princeton who led the criticism of the 1619 project, described the Dunning view as a Southern racist point of view, but that the authors of the project were also a kind of ideologue um, since it had discounted objections raised by white historians since publication. 
So the Trump administration had no problem labeling the 1619 Project as promoting a false narrative, labeling it reckless propaganda, properly, uh, particularly to the extent that the project tended to cast America as evil. It urged patriotic education. The administration appointed the 1676 Commission. And on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, uh, that commission issued its 1776 report. And the report stated that its intent was to cultivate a better education among Americans in the principles and history of our nation, and in the hope that a rediscovery of those principles and the forms of constitutional government will lead to a more perfect union. It offered what it claimed was a nonpartisan review of American history. The report was roundly rejected as puerile and devoid of historical grounding. Among other things, the report used selected quotes of abolitionists and out of context. It excused the nation's founders for owning slaves and defended the racist three-fifths compromise in 1787, where the Northern and Southern states agreed to count black people as three-fifths of a person for congressional representation as a necessary uh, uh, to form a durable union. The report listed progressivism, you know, which concern, had concerns about workplace safety, food safety, and child labor, along with slavery and fascism in its list of challenges to America's principles. And the former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, a member of the commission, denounced multiculturalism as not who America is, implying that diversity in America distorts its glorious founding and what the country is all about. I think that is extremely telling about where America is, if, um, if Mike Pompeo represents America. The report especially condemned American universities, which he accused, they accused as being behind a defamation of our treasured national statues of those whose main historical significance lay in the defense of slavery or other forms of white supremacy. Most of the authors listed on the commission lack credentials as historians and the report was missing citations, bibliographies and scholarly references. The American Historical Association described the authors as calling for a form of government indoctrination of American students and in the process elevate ignorance above the past to a civic virtue. The point of this colloquy within the academy and the government is that what I take from it is that history is not embraced by all as an objective construct. And what people who write history are, that people who write history are not simply objective arbiter of facts. Much of American history has been written by scholars offering ideological claims in place of rigorous historical analysis. But which claims are ideological and which ones are supported by objective evidence is not always easy to uh, discern. So that leads to, a, to the problem of identifying elements of our country worth of, worthy of preserving and celebrating. You know, what parts of our cultural heritage should be, should be guarded and passed on to future generations? Our cultural past is the basis for our collective self-identity and is central to the metaphysics of a person. It defines us. Individuals as social beings are constituted by their historical and cultural heritage both overt and subliminal processes. We attain reflective consciousness through the narratives of the past. Our culture guides social and political transformation by reminding us of the worthy acts of prior generations. So the real test is determining the particular vehicle for expressing cultural memory in a democracy. I think as the recent um, movement to remove monuments, Confederate monuments has revealed, Commemoration of historical event can be a highly contested process. It can be as contested as the appropriate interpretation of the, of the event itself, because it is an attempt to determine the character of the present by controlling our interpretation of the past. Just what a flag, statue, or monument stands for needs to be evaluated in public debate, I think. Since the content of cultural memory is contested, so too is the meaning and value we give to flags and statues and monuments. The question then arises uh, is how should we express our cultural memory so that we strike the right balance between constancy and cultural change? And it's also fair to ask whether democratic rules 
um, should be employed for making decisions on the elements of cultural memory. How we organize public space reveals definitive features of our cultural and political attitudes. And the idea of commemoration is inextricably connected to perennial vexing issues in constitutional law and theory, especially concerning government speech and government neutrality and multiculturalism. As I mentioned, a number of states have in place um, statue statutes, which compel cities and uh, local governments to continue to maintain these monuments that continue to speak to its offensive uh, narratives. And a number of states uh, have uh, rejected appeals based on um, First Amendment government speech uh, principles. But recently in Virginia, uh, in response to the uh, protests in Charlottesville, the legislature gave um, local governments the authority to reconsider the value and, and merits in Confederate statutes so they could remove them if the consensus is that they no longer serve any legitimate public end. But if we were to submit the, the process to um, democratic processes, I think it's, it's fair to ask, you know, how should the government proceed in deciding which episodes are to be commemorated you know, surely the government could not commemorate an historical uh, epic in religious terms. Uh, and then there are challenges under multiculturalism as to how to assess the meaning of minority cultures within the dominant culture. Not all monuments to the Confederacy and its leaders were erected without anything, I mean, nearly all the monuments to the Confederacy and its leaders were erected without anything resembling a de democratic process. And regardless of their representation in the actual population in any given constituency, neither African Americans who are particularly offended nor other citizens had any voice and opportunity to raise questions about the purposes or likely impact of the honor accorded to the builders of the Confederate States of America. So the, the course I just taught, uh, as Jorge mentioned, you know, caused me to uh, reflect on uh, why we preserve history, you know, what underlies our historic preservation uh, policies and programs. So it, it's certainly, it, it's, it's not solely to celebrate beautiful things, but also to remember some things that are ugly to remind us where we failed in our humanity. But by preserving these ugly monuments in situ, we simply mark them where they stand. We don't erect monuments uh, to them in public places. Uh, a nun is erected elsewhere to create a story, create a story, but stays where they are to tell the story as it is or was. The Japanese American internment camps immediately uh, come to mind, and there are monuments to our irrational fear and prejudice against those we perceived as others, not celebrations of that event in our history. But the celebration is, is what Confederate statues, flags, and other emblems do. Some of them are even on the National Register of, of, of Historic Places and others are National Historic Landmarks. They were erected to celebrate supremacy and subjugation. So moving forward, you know, should all or some or all of the monuments be destroyed? The Mellon Foundation recently announced a plan to spend more than $250 million toward projects for the removal of Confederate monuments and for rethinking what forms monuments can take and what communities want from them. That is, what stories do they think should be told? I think all of this raises the question of, of to what extent the state should have any role in erecting statues. You know, whether the whole process of commemoration itself is defective and should be revised or abandoned. You know, surely we should refrain from investing in artifacts that meaning whose meaning uh, that is discerned from the respectful, committed interactions among um, fellow, fellow citizens. Is a democratic process amenable to this endeavor though? You know, how do we determine who counts as a member of the deciding group? What issues are susceptible to majoritarian decision-making? You know, what should be the design of and the rules for this democratic forum? Representative or direct initiatives? Nonetheless, deliberation on the merits and values of commemoration from a range of constituents should be done to evaluate the impacts of the narratives. Will there ever be total agreement? Not likely. 
But there must be a commitment to collective resolution of conflicts through new deliberation and avenues for re revisiting decisions as discoveries are made about the merits uh, thought to be questioned, unquestioned earlier. Perhaps the only measurable test for an assertive narrative is, a, is in the sense of plausibility and objective offense. This is not simply a matter of inaccuracy, willful or otherwise. And when states, political parties, and social groups appeal to collective memory, their motives are far from trivial. Modern commemorations were invented to make up for a lack of organic unity within modern nations and societies and to force a conception of the past and acts that could not be justified by objective fact. Remembrance, however important a role it may play in the life of groups and whatever moral and ethical demands it responds to carries risks that at times also has an existential, uh, existential character and impact. During wars or social uh, and political crises, the danger is not what the American historian uh, Yusef Hayim uh, Yerahalmi Yer call, call the terror forgetting, but rather the terror of remembering too well, too vividly. He means that there are cases where forgetting may do injustice to the past, remembering does an injustice to the present. When collective memory condemns communities to feel the pain of their historical wounds and the bitterness of their historical grievances, it is not the duty to remember, but a duty to forget that should be honored. Memory, like democracy, is not a material, natural and internal essence, but a contingent, amorphous, and biased construct in constant revision and recasting. As one writer has uh, stated, the shadows of the past stretch into the present and much like statues in public parks, they loom darkly over public consciousness. That's, I'll take questions. Thank you, that was fantastic. And I, um, <clears throat> I'm going to have us imagine this thunderous clapping of <laughs> 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 since we, um, we've now learned that Zoom uh, allows you to silence everyone in the room, but does not allow you to let everyone speak at the same time in the room. Um, so there, there, there is some of what you're saying um, of that kind of forced, uh, forced unity and forced silence that um, in the very in the very medium that we're using to have this discussion. Um, which is quite quite unfortunate, but it's the reality of it. And um, I want to encourage everyone to ask questions as best we can using um, the chat or um, the, um, you know, we have some instructions here. You can raise your hand, you check the chat box for, for some, for the instructions on how to do that. And I'm also going to encourage those of you that would like to participate more fully in, in the, in the, in the discussion to go ahead and turn on your um, your uh, your um, video because it's nice to see everyone. So if you don't turn it on, that's okay. But it, we would we would be very very pleased to to have you um, to have you turn on your your screen. So I see that Erica has volunteered the first question, and I'm going to turn to Erica then. Hi, Professor Green, thank you so much for very, you know, thoughtful and compelling talk. Uh, I'm another faculty member, full-time faculty member in uh, the Historic Preservation Program. Uh, and I, I wanted to, to uh, try and, and push on this idea of um, discursive deliberation um, as a form of policy, because you know, fundamentally, whether we are adding to heritage rosters or subtracting from heritage rosters, you know, taking monuments down or adding things to it, um, you know, how do you see existing policy structures, um, which are so much geared toward, you know, just kind of adding to the list, <laughs> um, changing within the preservation enterprise to afford the kinds of deliberation um, uh, and you know, consider 
over time, what decisions about the things we have called heritage mean, you know, what kinds of effects they've had, distributive effects on communities? Well, I think certainly listening to um, the people in the streets, you know, about the issues that uh, concern them uh, is, is, a, is, is a first step. Um, and I'm not sure that the, the process of putting things on the National Register uh, is fully embraces the, the views of, of many sectors in society. It's, it's very narrow and a lot of discretion be given to the, the keeper. But then those nominations come from the states um, through the State Historic Preservation Officer. And I don't, I'm not sure that that's a really broad process uh, either, um, but it, it doesn't, it's not, I don't believe it's susceptible to uh, the same democratic process as uh, is involved in, in electing people to office. Uh, even um, on the local level, when lo local landmarks preservations commissions uh, decide on landmarking, there is a, a hearing uh, held and members of the public are invited to, to speak. Um, but I'm not sure to what extent the, the uh, commissions respond in a really deep uh, way to the objections uh, by uh, those um, uh, who attend the hearing. So I think they're more guided by the, the criteria that they are charged with uh, applying. So you know, maybe um, revisiting the criteria uh, with some initial um, requirement that that uh, the, the 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 merits of the of the of the proposed work uh, meets a, a certain uh, test, and I suggest it may be a test of, you know, plausibility, whether it's 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 uh, could be supported uh, by objective fact, but also um, the extent to which stepping out of one's own skin to see whether or not it might uh, somehow uh, offend. But I I can't see that there'd be any kind of monument or that wouldn't be taken differently by different people depending upon their uh, you know, their um, uh, world views and, and history and, and that sort of thing. But I think you know, maybe starting with um, revising the criteria that the decision makers are charged with uh, applying, but also inviting you know true uh, or uh, having true input uh, by members of the public uh, might help uh, as, as well. Um, but I, I'm not sure, with, I, I think that, that because there, there's still such pushback even as to the con Confederate monuments, it may be hard to find consensus on, on just about anything. I was, I was thinking about the um, New York City's uh, efforts to uh, broaden the, the kinds of statues in, in New York City parks. And I think one actor complained that we didn't celebrate Mother Cabrini. Uh, and uh, there was one monument to the uh, women's suffrages, uh, Stanton and, and, and Anthony, and it didn't include a black person. Um, and so they added uh, Sojourner sort of Truth uh, to it. I'm not sure whether or not those associations were uh, historically uh, accurate, um, but um, but I, I think the there should be some efforts to um, again put in. You know, some regard for uh, the impact of uh, a celebration or, or a landmarking or, or, or listing on on people, and that and that can only happen by inviting, I think, a broad a cross section of, of views and attitudes. Other, um, other questions or follow up to that? I've got a follow up. I could ask okay. questions all day. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> So as, as a lawyer, then, you know, how do you see some of the legal tools that have been put in place both to um, challenge some of these issues, the way in which spatial claims have been made based on, um, uh, you know, these, these narratives, in some cases, very private narratives, but also the way in which the law has been used to protect them. And I'm thinking specifically of um, the Alabama uh, Monuments Memorial Act, which basically made it illegal to take down any monument more than 50 years old in the state. You know, and so the, the mayor of Birmingham basically built a plywood wall around the Confederate monument <laughs> to try and skirt around it. Can you, you know, from the legal perspective, how do you see um, this playing out through the courts? 
Well, I think the, the, the Alabama Supreme Court just recently rejected uh, a claim of a First Amendment violation and even an equal protection violation, finding that the cities vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state had no constitutional rights that could be asserted. So uh, in those stats, some of the statutes prohibits not only removing or altering, but even contextualizing a monument. Uh, so it, it, it may vary from state to state as to what the attitude uh, is. Um, I think in, in Tennessee, the, the mayor um, uh, Memphis uh, tried to camouflage a monument as well, which would sort of in, in violation of, of, the, of the Tennessee statute. And the, the state decided to withhold appropriations or allocations of funds for um, public services and, and punishment. Uh, for that. And there are a number of ruses that cities uh, engaged in, uh, like where a monument was on uh, uh, public land and the statute prohibited uh, alterations to monuments on public land, the, the city sold the land to a private entity uh, and therefore was able to move it. But then that met with, um, you know, some consternation from the, from the city. So, but as I was saying, Virginia, you know, heard the protest uh, from Richmond and Charlottesville, and the, the statute was amended to allow cities to rethink the monuments, and, and they did. Governor Northam did order the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue, um, um, finding that there was uh, permission to do it. But, but it wasn't just the statute uh, that stood as, an, stood as an obstacle to removing them. Some of the, the terms under which they were donated or erected um, prohibited Move, removal as well. Some of them had, came with uh, covenants that prohibited any changes and the law would enforce the covenants, but only on the grounds that covenants uh, do not offend public policy. So at the time, of course, you know, being racist and, and white supremacists or not didn't offend public policy. But in Virginia, just recently, they decided, found that public policy has changed. Among other things, uh, the, the state decided to recognize Juneteenth as a state holiday. And that's the day when uh, slaves in the South heard about the Emancipation uh, Proclamation. They couldn't remember the exact date in, in June, but sometime in that month. Uh, and also uh, the, the governor referred to the, uh, the, the amendment of the statue and they had removed the Robert E. Lee statue from the US Capitol. I mean, these monuments stood in the US Capitol even because the agreement was that each state could erect a monument or two monuments as, as of, of their choosing. And of course, Virginia had Robert E. Lee there and they decided to remove it. So, you know, the, 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 the main um, um, uh, impetus or movement of these statutes may come from people on the ground, you know, and not waiting for the states to amend their laws or not waiting for the courts to see the impositions, uh, but just to get out there and knock them down. And that's what's been happening throughout the, the, the country. Mark. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Shelby, uh, uh, not only for the talk today, um, but also for your incredible contributions when Jorge and I uh, w did this fall studio. Um, and we have several of those students here to see you again. Um, and, uh, um, and so that relates to, um, I actually have a two, two totally distinct questions. So the first one relates to that, which is uh, you um, were there not only uh, because of your uh, involvement in these issues, but also because you were on the board um, of the John Jay um, Heritage Center. And, um, and that's another um, in, in uh, kind of flipping, flipping those coins, here's someone who was deeply involved in issues of, aboli uh, of abolition, but also, as, as we said all throughout the semester, also um, did own some slaves and that's a, it's a very complicated uh, history. And that's what we were trying to engage in the fall studio and you were very helpful in helping us think through that. So that relates to the question of uh, contextualization. In other words, uh, if um, now we're not talking necessarily about removal, but what is it to keep something in place or even to move it and contextualize it? Because um, given um, 
uh, I'll go ahead and just say it as, as clearly as I can, given the way in which narratives are able to be um, uh, narrated without any verifiable history to them. Uh, um, and we have some people in the Congress now that are doing so. Uh, <laughs> if, if we then open up the democratic process and say, yes, okay, we're gonna contextualize this and every side can tell their story, then there would, I assume you would say, need to be a process by which the verifiability of some of those stories uh, can become part of that, uh, um, that democratic matter is not just anything goes, but, um, uh, but there are some um, measures uh, um, to, to do that. So that's the first question. What do, you, what do you want to say about contextualization? And then totally unrelated, or maybe actually related, which is you also talked about how a uh, union general went in and just you know, did horrific things in the South. Is are there? I I could look it up, but I just uh, uh, very quickly. Are there calls to bring down the statues for Sherman and <laughs> rename the schools that were named for the Union hero Sherman because of the terrible things that he did? I, I don't think so. Sherman was on the right side of the war. I no, think, no, and right really, under, yeah. I want it has to do with pers perspectives uh, and. Uh, you know, the, the South thought the North were aggressive and treacherous uh, people and wasn't about slavery at all, but just about being free from oppression. Um, but uh, in the, I see the, 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 the first question, you know, I think contextualization will, would work only so much. Um, I think in, in some uh, places there where there has been resistance to remove a, a statue then the response was to erect a, a counter narrative in a statue across the street. Uh, and so if anyone wanted, you know, some context, one would have to walk across the street or, you know, putting up a, a plaque, um, you know, may uh, offer some more information. But, but I think that, you know, the, the, the large presence of this monolithic thing, this thing made of stone and granite, you know, offers a, compare, a compelling narrative. It speaks more loudly, I think, than a than a small plaque, if, if we know what the monument, to whom the monument um, is, is, is devoted to. Um, but I, I, I think it, 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 it is important. I think it with, in the case of the uh, John Jay site as well, I mean, he is celebrated for what he did, but also there's no effort to uh, camouflage the things that we don't like in, in, his, uh, in his past. But, you know, I, I think it, it it, 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 it would help, I think, you know, having, uh, you know, some story uh, associated with a monument, but I'm not sure that that's, that'll work so much with the uh, monuments in the, in the public spaces. These are, you know, huge things, you know, with uh, soldiers atop ho horses and, uh, you know, and some of the monuments themselves describe, um, you know, why we celebrate this. Like, I guess the, it's a Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama was the site of that March on Selma, and that was named in honor of uh, a staunch uh, white supremacist and uh, um, uh, uh, one of the leaders in the, in the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and there's some um, movement down to rename that bridge in honor of, say, John Lewis, not even. Uh, but I don't know how you contextualize, you know, that honor. Uh, it's 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 just there um, as an immovable thing and and. Yes. Thank you. You know, you're giving us so much to think about. Um, yeah. Please feel free to, you know, raise your hands, turn on your screen, whatever you you may like. Um, um, just, I wanted to follow up on that a little bit um, uh, and and go back to to the, your um, your thinking about the the whether commemoration should be abandoned or the function of commemoration in in the public sphere. Um, and, and, and to kind of maybe take a little bit of a different tack to, uh, um, to talk about um, ideas and the ideas that these monuments represent, but also the confidence that we have on those ideas, right? So the confidence of our ideas. And if you look at, um, uh, at, at psychologists, they will tell you that the, the confidence that we have on our ideas re depends greatly on, on the degree of, in, of encounters with other people and in society that we tend to, we tend to be as a whole consensual 
and the ideas that we have come, not in our ideas, but the ideas that we really have a lot of confidence on. Um, those are ideas that other people, um, you know, reinforce. We hear those ideas all the time, or maybe the spaces that we inhabit re reinforce. So there is an area of psychology that is, uh, that researches high confidence errors. So ideas that we're very, very convinced about that are absolutely wrong. And the, they, they, they researched, you know, how do we change these ideas? How, how do we go about changing these ideas? And it turns out that, of course, you know, the, the presumption is that it's very difficult to change our ideas. But in fact, what they're finding out is that it's not so hard. We, we, we are capable of changing ideas, but it, that it requires the source has to be a certain uh, source we trust. And so this is um, my way of looping around to the law and the way that we trust or don't trust the law. Um, because of course, what we've seen, I mean, the way I think that part of your argument, if I understand it correctly, is that there is something about the law that still stands as a kind of um, theater of, of um, rational discussion and debate uh, into which certain evidence is admitted on the grounds that it is valid or not. You know, there is a kind of forensic um, uh, dimension to it, uh, back to what Mark was saying. And so the law stands in a way um, as the place in which we can imagine that there is, you know, we're going to get that, that uh, view that is going to change our view because it comes with a high degree of authority to us. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you how you felt, therefore, about the fact that a lot of the uh, movements to remove these statues were paralegal or, or uh, you know, they, they happened outside of the law. They were demonstrations who, in fact, were, um, um, you know, uh, uh, expressing a kind of frustration with the law. Um, and the legal system and the policing system that it it upholds and enables, and so there. If we are seeing, I mean, I'm, I I I I am wondering whether this calls in any way to question your upholding of the law as that as that last kind of refuge of um, uh, of, of rational dialogue and of a place where we can um, do away with our high confidence errors? Well, I, I think judges uh, have the same sets and varieties of, of biases as everybody. And I, I think we sort of see that um, in the sense that the, the courts didn't uh, act to help uh, Blacks right after the the Civil War, uh, and for nearly a century after, did the courts step in to, or at least were receptive uh, to complaints about injustice. And courts don't reach out. Uh, the cases have to come to the courts, uh, but, but courts are influenced in a very real way by things happening on the streets. Social protests, protests and public opinion uh, does inform uh, judges and that I think judges have a responsibility of advancing the law to be consistent with, with where society is, but within the confines of established principles. But the principles aren't written in stone. Uh, they, uh, law grows, law evolves. Uh, and I think in connection with uh, prevailing uh, sentiments, but it took, I think, advancing civil rights in the United States, it took very creative arguments on the part of the NAACP to win the ear of, of the, the courts. And then as the courts move to protect these rights, which are guaranteed in the constitution and in statutes, the, the court met with some uh, uh, protest that it was being an activist uh, court, uh, advancing society beyond um, the, the point where society uh, uh, should be. Um, but the, the reason for moving forward was um, you know, the, the, the public sentiments uh, had, had, been, uh, uh, had changed. So um, just as what happened, I guess, with the recent election, uh, President Trump you know, tried to, I thought he, he thought he appointed judges who would rule in his favor, irrespective of, of law or principle. 
but I think I have high regard that in our society, you know, we, we do still have an independent judiciary, but they're individuals with their own predilections and their own biases. Uh, just reading um, the case in which the Supreme Court affirmed a lower court decision declaring that segregation on public transportation in Montgomery, Alabama, which got to the court after a, a, the uh, blacks decided to launch a boycott, the majority um, decided that public transportation, uh, segregation public transportation was illegal because the Supreme Court had ruled that it was illegal in education in the Brown case. But there was a, a vigorous dissent, you know, who said that because the Supreme Court, that case, Brown talked, with educa talked about education, it didn't apply to the case of public transportation, that adhering to precedent was more important uh, than I think a, a result that seemed to be more sensible and, and more just. But fortunately, the majority uh, thought thought differently. Um, but it, that that judge didn't seem to care a whole lot about the social uh, impact on those who were relegated to giving up their seats um, just because they're black. Uh, only that the the prior ruling, the Plessy versus Ferguson ruling in 1896, said that separate but equal was perfectly fine. Uh, but in the Brown case, the court was receptive to the idea that um, exclusion in and of itself uh, makes the status of the blacks and whites uh, unequal uh, because it, it, it states you may not enter because of your race, not because there are any other um, objective reasons for uh, not allowing entry. Um, so it, it and, and think of where the Supreme Court now is in terms of um, rights to um, LGBTQ uh, people. Um, just thinking, you know, 20 years ago, um, the courts wouldn't wouldn't hear it, but um, because you know, I think states took the um, first step in legalizing uh, same-sex um, uh, marriage, and the the court heard what was happening, the movement in terms of public sentiment, uh, then it was open to new new ways of conceiving um, equal protection. But um, I, I think much of the movement has to come from citizens uh, on the ground and offering creative arguments uh, to the courts as to you know why a new view of rights and limits uh, ought to be uh, embraced. Going back to uh... John, uh, you, you mentioned uh, um, John Adams, uh, who was who thought monuments were anathema to democracy. I had not heard that before. That you, that was very interesting. And um, you know how, in light of what you just said about where we are in society today, um, how do you read that? How do you read that? Um, how do you read society uh, in relationship to that version of um, of what we could imagine the law? You know, the federal government shouldn't pay for monuments. You know, shouldn't have a policy to make you know monuments. Is that even possible today to for somebody to argue that? Do you think? Well, I I, I think the, the government has you know broad discretion in finding you know a, a, a public purpose for its, its expenditures. I think it was just this attitude that um, it. Um, brought us a little closer to monarchy as we had just freed ourselves from uh, in, in England. So we, by monuments, we would, uh, and I, I think they offered the George Washington the role of king, but he uh, refused that and also refused, you know, serving uh, forever. But I think it was just the idea of that we're all equal uh, here, that he thought that um, a monument or a statue to Washington, you know, would um, be contrary to that that notion. Uh, but just think, there was there were there were talks about um, carving an image of the former president in Mount Rushmore. Um, I'm not sure how far that's going to go, but but yes, and we came just this close to losing our democracy. I think I think, but for the independence of our judiciary, we, we might have been there. So, so, it's a sobering thought. Um, and certainly uh, in relationship to the, um, 
the report that you mentioned, you know, in your reading of it, the 1776 report, uh, and and its uh, and and its tendentiousness, as you as you describe it, and and the way you you spoke about ideology standing in as history, in a way that report was performing, in the same manner as monuments had been performing, in the South, uh, as as, a, as an ideology standing in as history, and. Um, it led me to think a little bit about the way, you know, if you think of a monument as a, as a, as a medium uh, for communication, uh, for public communication, uh, which is uh, how you presented it, you know, the way in which these, um, these kind of edicts and reports um, are, are media for a kind of communication that is in a way segregated. It's, uh, it's the, 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 the segregation seems to be in these kind of echo chambers um, where these are not intended to convince anybody of anything new, but to reinforce a kind of ideological position um, uh, that, it, that, is, that is seen as intractable. You know, this is a kind of, um, again, a, a kind of something we have high confidence in, but, but it stands in, in opposition to what other people have. Therefore, we don't talk to those other people. <laughs> Yeah, there does seem to be sort of a, a what seems to be an unbridgeable chasm, you know, between sectors in our society. You know, those who are open to embracing differences and all peoples and and fairness and and, and justice and 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 those who are just don't believe in in, in liberalism uh, at all, uh, and and those who even question. The validity of court decisions and 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 our democratic processes. Um, so I I don't know whether you know we 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 um, explored whether or not there was any way to anything we could say to you know these people who we might might call populist and whether or not they would hear uh, anything we said. And I'm I'm very doubtful. So I, I don't know whether. Um, Things in society will have to change that um, may affect them in a very personal way uh, that will cause them to um, rethink some of the positions uh, is necessary. But I'm not sure that um, taking down the monuments or offering um, alternative na na narratives or um, narratives based on objective fact or verified fact will make any impression on uh, this group. So I'm just hoping that it won't take another generation for us to get to a point where we can uh, engage in true dialogue and grow from each other. But and I, and I, as far as the monuments, I think you know because they're they're there and they're loud and and they're monolithic. You know, I think removing them from the uh, view from the consciousness, you know, may cause us to be more expansive. I think in our thinking. Um, uh, about other things and you know, different stories and different histories and different values. Right. And, and I wonder, you know, in, in light of this, I mean, certainly, for example, in academia, you know, I'm thinking of you as a scholar of the law, right? I mean, you're, you're, um, um, there are checks on, on the reality that you might propose through peer review, through a kind of taking a broad sample of people in the profession and the you know in the discipline that that are going to evaluate and judge um, blindly, um, and that that kind of fair sample of society doesn't really I mean really exist let's say in the channels of communication that we that we consume because everything is so let's say targeted to the audience to begin with. So the monument offers an opportunity, doesn't it, to to have to be there by happenstance on your in your life, you know, to not be something that's algorithmically pre-programmed for you to actually encounter, but to just to to, to be something that you happen upon. And in that sense, I wonder whether there is um, some potential for a new kind of monument that would be able to help. Um, begin that kind of, um, uh, let's say, broadening of the sample with which you talk. You know, if you're not going to talk to people, maybe you just have, you know, and you avoid them in your car or what have you, and right. the schools you go to and every, and in every aspect of your life, at least there is 
some aspect of your life in which you might have to encounter um, another position. And, 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 and in, that, in that regard, I, you know, because you ended on a note that, that seemed to kind of suggest that, I mean, not, not to be too blunt, but that you, were, you, were, you didn't see a lot of possibilities for monuments. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to push a little bit to, to see whether there is some hope there for it for for the for a monument in space or that you see any hope for it uh or it's or, or it's you just see it as a as a medium that is obsolete and of another another era and it should just be um done away with like you know we did with away with steam engines and, and whatnot yeah <laughs> you know? well the the range of statues and monuments that are being challenged these days is just very vast. Um, well, Teddy Roosevelt, Columbus, Winston Churchill, I'm not sure about um, George Washington, but it just may be the, the next one. So I don't know whether there's any figure um, that most people or, or all would choose to celebrate without some kind of question. So it, it may be that we may need to just mark places where things, or mark an event. This is where this happened. Um, and then leave it to the, the audience to um, develop their own stories or take their own meanings uh, from it. Um, because an event is indisputable. Um, you know, we know the Twin Towers were knocked down, and um, we know that this this thing happened uh, here. But if if we venture to um, assign labels like winners and losers and heroes and villains, um, I I doubt that we'll ever come to any agreement as as we are now seeing or evaluating past events in light of modern sensibilities, um, and I think that's that's inevitable. Um, but um, I, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I think the, again, the, the whole process of the whole thought of some democratic process of commemoration is something that has a lot of obstacles to carrying out in a way that would make sense. But certainly I think uh, offering the opportunity for broad, a broader dialogue is, is a good way to go if we are committed to commemorating. And I think there's really a value or role in society to say things to society that encourages respect for institutions, expect respect for communities and love of community and communities and that sort of thing. But I guess deciding, you know, what uh, the the vehicles for those messages is is the real challenge uh, here. So, would you take another uh, comment and question, or I mean, I'm yes. mindful of the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Um, but uh, Erica, is, I saw you gesturing. Did you want to uh, jump in? Well, I, I, you know, I was, I don't, it's, it's so close to eight o'clock that I think that I would take us down a rabbit hole if I start to, to <laughs> go down this. Um, only because there, it was, um, there's been a conference going on this week um, on on decentering um, narratives uh, in relationship to preservation, and and one of the terms that um, was used was commemorative justice, ah. um, and that you know these this the 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 claim the ability to be able to claim space for commemorative purposes is something that is sought by many groups who have been excluded, and so. You know, there is a, a, a certain irony in saying, well, but, you know, the problem is, you know, this kind of commemoration is so fraught, it's been so abused, it's, it's you know, we see histories of bias. And so we have to be a lot more careful now about who gets to commemorate and how they get to commemorate. And that in and of itself, there seems to be a, a procedural justice question that I, you know, I, I think, um, compels us to consider, you know, um, what are we willing to kind of give up in this process? Um, and I, I, as students who are on know, I constantly go back to the um, Smithsonian debate surrounding the Enola Gay mm -hmm. and its interpretation, which speaks to your, you know, kind of, this is, you know, if you just give the facts, 
Well, you know, the Enola Gay sits in a large airport hangar now with just information about its manufacture. You know, it's this long, it has this long a wingspan, it mm -hmm. was manufactured in Indiana or whatever, ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba, and that's it. And so, you know, it seems to me there's something horribly lost, you know, in, in, in this idea that, well, if we just, you know, stick to the facts, ma'am, you know, that somehow it's okay that we, this encounter with this object um, still has meaning. Um, and it's just, we're just going to let everyone else ascribe meaning to it. I, I, I sort of feel that there are some, you know, where's the edge of what is acceptable or not acceptable in, in narrative. I, I think that's 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 a very uh, insightful um, for sure. I mean, it has all kinds of significance on you know, what we did during that time and the decisions um, that were made uh, that we may think differently about uh, now. And all that would be lost, uh, right, without some kind of story um, and you know some avenue for criticism. And I don't know what that would be um, in the context of a, a fixed monument, but you know maybe uh, some multimedia um, uh, event that's uh, or, or installation associated with a monument in a museum that offers various views on or um, angles from the from the story. You know, might might be something that may be useful, and it makes me think about the. The namings of streets in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. And, and there is often a lot of pushback by communities that are white. They don't want the association with a, a black man because they think that it's going to reduce property values. So, and that the names of those uh, of the streets in his honor tend to be in deteriorating neighborhoods around uh, the country. And I think that those are. The, the places where they're least needed. I think they need, they're more needed in the broader society for people to understand what he did for the country and not just for, for black people in terms of, of rights. But um, there are just, again, a lot of deep seated uh, biases that still animate us in, uh, in all these decisions. And I, and I think that's a, you know, um, you know commemorative justice is, uh, is a really uh, important uh, movement. If, if it is a movement, it ought to be something that uh, should, you know, drive decisions and dialogues as we go forward. Yeah. Well, Shelby, I, I want to thank you for this uh, stimulating talk. Uh, really, the 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 best that we can hope for, you know, is for for having our ideas challenged and and having us um, really rethink our our own presuppositions. You've done that. You've brought us into a world that that we thought we knew about, you know, mm -hmm. preservation law, and you've made us discover it in a in a new way. And also, I really appreciated the fact that from the law, you got us to the appearance of things, to the way that preservation looks and how it matters in how we think about justice. Um, so I really, um, in the name of all of the faculty and the, and the students and the, the the academic community, thank you deeply for for the talk and for joining us with your. Um, masterclass, which has been transformative for, for us uh, as well. So we hope that you'll come back many other times and, uh, <laughs> and, and thanks again. And thank you everyone for joining us. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it tremendously. Learned a whole lot. <laughs> thank you again. Right.